Jeff Jensen. I'm uh, the Wynn Professor here at the Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Denver. Um, I also chair the Coalition for the Promotion of Behavioral Health, which is an interdisciplinary group of prevention scientists, researchers, uh, practitioners that are, that are working to implement action steps in, some, in a framework we call Unleashing the Power of Prevention. You will hear more about this framework this morning from our plenary speaker, David Hawkins. Um, today's session also marks the, the inaugural presentation in a series that we're beginning here at the, Grand, at the Graduate School of Social Work called the uh, Social Work Grand Challenges Science for Action series. You see a slide up there. Um, this series has been created in response to our school's commitment to using evidence to inform the direction of social interventions and social policy. The series is also conducted in coordination with the Grand Challenges for Social Work initiative, which is sponsored by the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. Um, ensured Healthy Development for All Youth is one of the 12 Grand Challenges that was selected by the Academy. And this, this event today is the first um, in our series of uh, Science for Action series. So we, we will have additional sessions in, uh, on issues of homelessness and decarceration in, in February and April of, of the coming year, and we hope you can attend those as well. I'd like to take just a few moments to give you an overview of the, and the plan for the day. Um, we're very excited to begin this morning with some special guests um, and, and uh, recognition of uh, their efforts to promote youth development and, and, and prevent behavioral problems. And this includes, a, a, this will include a welcome from Dean Amanda McBride, as well as comments from Lieutenant Governor Donna Lynn, who's joined us. And we also have a uh, video tape, tape presentation from Governor John Hickenlooper that we'll be showing uh, in, in a short time. We've set up morning and, and uh, uh, we set up plenary, we have a plenary this morning, excuse me, and then followed by two pa panel sessions which showcase ways in which evidence can be used to advance prevention strategies and promote healthy youth development. These sessions are intended to illustrate how we can collectively unleash the power of prevention to reduce behavioral problems, behavioral health problems like substance use, delinquency, school dropout, anxiety and depression, and risky sexual behavior. So the morning is going to feature a plenary by uh, David Hawkins of the University of Washington, followed by three expert uh, respondents to his address. We'll have a discussion of major prevention initiatives that are being funded and and rolled out in Colorado by key state uh, leaders and, and community leaders as well. And then finally, a discussion of ways to improve infrastructure for delivering preventive interventions to, to young people. The afternoon sessions are going to focus uh, more specifically on the Communities That Care, CTC, initiative that has been implemented in 48 Colorado communities in the past 12 to 18 months. Um, as, many of you, as many of you know, CTC is a prevention system that provides tools for communities to organize prevention efforts, assess risk and protective factors for behavioral health problems, and select and implement tested and effective prevention strategies. So we'll have a panel of CTC community coordinators and coalition members uh, here today at 1.15. Uh, we'll also have a breakout session at 2.30 that will allow time for people involved in CTC to interact and learn more from one another's experiences. And at the same time, there'll be a parallel breakout session at 2.30 concerning uh, preparing the workforce uh, for uh, pr prevention practice, something we uh, have been putting considerable effort into uh, here in the School of Social Work and across the country. Um, so really, today's panels are intended to, to be a forum for sharing information about what's happening in our state, for fielding questions uh, from, from you, the audience. Um, we're also live streaming today. Uh, welcome to all of you out there who are watching that way uh, until 2.30. Uh, so we hope to have, have some good time for interaction as well. Um, as such, the panelists then will be really responding to questions from our, our moderators as opposed to presenting uh, 
uh, formal presentation. So we're in the spirit of more interaction. We've, we're going to use, use that format today. Um, a few quick logistics. Um, there's restrooms uh, right outside that door in the back down the hall. Um, we have lunch uh, is provided at the Noble School of Hospitality, which is actually a very short walk from here. So when we break for lunch, we'll have people to escort you up to up to where the lunch will be served. Um, the breakout sessions, as I mentioned, there's two. The one on addressing CTC will be in this room, and the other on the workforce development will be in room 417, and we'll have people to direct you upstairs if you are going that way. So a couple of quick thank yous. Um, Dean McBride, uh, who will be coming up here in a moment, I want to thank her for supporting this, this effort and uh, the Science for Action series, and she probably had no idea we were going to bring the scope of it as quite as big as we did with this first one, uh, but we're delighted to have your uh, uh, support. Um, Abby Howard and Trish uh, becker Hafnar back in the corner there have been wonderful in arranging things uh, for this event. Um, and I also want to thank all the panelists and, and speakers. You'll see them in turn today, uh, particularly those who came from afar. You've probably gathered we have a little cluster from the University of Washington here. Uh, David Hawkins, uh, Richard Rico Catalano, Kevin Haggerty, and Blair Brook Weiss have come, come to Denver from Seattle, so I want to give a special shout out for them, uh, to them. Also, several people have really helped shape this uh, event today, and I just want to quickly acknowledge them. Um, Ann Renault Avila uh, from the Governor's Office, uh, State Planning and Budget, unfortunately, is, won't be with us today, but she was helpful in organizing and uh, some of the sessions as well as Aaron Flynn, I think I saw Aaron somewhere, and Allie Maffey from the Department of Public Health and Environment. You'll hear from them both later. And Brian Bumbarger, who also had some great ideas about shaping some of the sessions. Uh, Brian's with our Coalition for the Promotion of Behavioral Health and the National Prevention uh, Science Coalition. So we're at a very important juncture in promoting healthy youth development and in young people right now as we speak. Every day in Colorado and across the country, behavioral health problems take a, a very heavy toll on really millions of lives. We know that these problems cause deep, often long-term damage to young people, families, and communities, and that there are sig significant and very persistent disparities, disparities in these problems by race, ethnicity, and other characteristics. For decades, the approach to promoting positive development and preventing behavioral health problems has really been to isolate specific behaviors and to treat them one at a time, often at a high and, and very ongoing cost. Today you will hear that we have very strong evidence showing we can prevent behavioral health problems in young people before they occur, before they occur or become persistent. So really today's sessions I view in, in some ways as both the celebration of, of how, far, how far we have come in the field of prevention and prevention science, and a challenge to, to the work that remains and that lies ahead. We celebrate that our state leaders have recognized the importance of youth development and the power of prevention by allocating sig significant funds to support substance abuse prevention in particular. Uh, uh, through the illustrated, uh, most clearly through the funding of 48 CTC sites in the past 12 to 18 months. We also celebrate that Colorado has a strong group of administrators, policy makers, community leaders, and practitioners who are very committed to improving the lives of, of young people. And as I look out here, I, I see many of you uh, today. Um, Finally, we also celebrate that we have a very active group of prevention and youth development researchers in our state, in Colorado. Many are here today. A shining example is uh, the fact that Colorado is the home of the, the very influential blueprints for healthy youth development, the most widely recognized test uh, uh, registry of tested and effective programs in the country. It's wonderful, Adele Elliott, who has led that effort for Many years from the University of Colorado at Boulder is, is with us today, and I think Sharon is on her way, perhaps, Sharon Mahali. 
So wonderful to have you here today. Um, the, the challenge really lies ahead then, that lies ahead for us is really applying what we have come to know about healthy youth develop and development and the effectiveness of prevention to a com comprehensive and sustained plan of program and policy actions. And that's what we'll be kind of focused on today and, and it'll, you'll hear more about this as the day proceeds. So thank you, I wanna thank you for coming. Um, it's great to see um, so many colleagues here. It's uh, wonderful we don't get together in one place very often, uh, those of us doing this kind of work here in Colorado, so it's, it's great to see you all in, in, uh, in uh, here today. Um, we do really feel strongly we can promote healthy youth development, prevent behavioral health problems, um, increase social justice by, by using evidence to guide our actions. This is the first in a series at the School of Social Work where, you, where we're, we're bringing this uh, to the public, so to speak, and this is, that really is at the heart of our Science to Action series. So let me uh, turn now to uh, uh, an introduction of uh, Dean Amanda Moore McBride, and Amanda's gonna come up and offer a few, few comments in turn. Um, Amanda McBride is the Morris Indeed Endowed Dean at the Graduate School of Social Work. She is an internationally recognized expert in civic and community engagement, and her scholarship focuses on promoting engagement and inclusion through programs, policy, and education. Dean McBride has authored or co-authored more than 70 articles, books, and special journal issues on these and related topics. And she told me that I should not go on with her bio any longer. So I, I'll just bring her up. But I'm, I'm delighted to introduce you uh, to uh, Dean McBride, who will offer a few comments. <laughs> Good morning, welcome to the Graduate School of Social Work in the University of Denver. We're delighted to see new faces in the audience today. We have some students, some faculty, some alum, but as Jeff said, we have many uh, people who have traveled long distances uh, across the state this morning to be here with us. This is actually uh, not quite yet, but it's a sold out crowd. We actually sold all seats uh, for this event and we already have people joining us on live stream. I wanna say why I think that is. We've, we've hit a chord with this event and in many ways it reflects our, our vision for the school. And uh, you know, higher education's really being challenged right now in the United States in terms of the value that it provides to communities. And we heard that loud and clear over the last year as we engaged over 100 and, uh, 750 people uh, in our strategic planning process. They said, you know, you do good work as a school. You're definitely developing the, the social work workforce for Colorado. But that research, uh, we would prefer it didn't uh, rest on a cloud somewhere or on a shelf or in a journal article that we, the public, cannot even access. Instead, we want you to translate that for the general public and make it applied and applicable to our everyday lives. And our faculty have welcomed that charge. And in that way, this series is a response to that charge that we be more applicable and more applied in the work that we do. What I love about uh, this series is that it is framed around the social work grand challenges. There are 12 grand challenges, and in other disciplines, they might refer to these as wicked problems. These are the vexing issues in society that have been with us pretty much since the dawn of civilization. And it's, it's a call that we take the best available evidence and apply it to actually addressing these grand challenges so that we will begin to move the needles on, on these major issues. It's, it's, um, it's taking evidence to practice, it's taking evidence to policy, and what better state to hold up as an example than Colorado. In our progressive government, we have actually uh, had a great history of taking evidence to policy and practice, and uh, we're starting today with youth development because that's one of the areas where we have had great success uh, in our state in, in implementing um, evidence for action. I am 
delighted that our faculty here at the School of Social Work actually have uh, a deep area of expertise in youth development, and uh, Professor Jeff Jensen actually has led the way. He's committed his entire life to youth development, from his MSW to then working with youth to then going back and getting his PhD, and uh, so grateful for his leadership. It, it was him and maybe a couple of beers and me that said, well, we got to do something about this, right? <laughs> so that's, that's that's really where this series came from. It wasn't the strategic <laughs> planning process. Um, but it, it's, um, it, I, what I want this series to be is a model for others. And that was one of the reasons we wanted to live stream it. So it would be accessible to other schools of social work across the country that are also attempting to address these issues in their communities. We want to put models forward in terms of what Colorado is doing in each, one, each, of, these er, each of these grand challenges uh, so that others can, can follow. So with with that, uh, the emphasis today is about a human potential and that it will only be realized if life circumstances are changed for our young people and paths are put in front of them where they can um, realize uh, their potential. Um, it, it's, I, I'm so grateful for the commitment that our school has in this area and the leaders of our state. And Lieutenant Governor uh, Donna Lynn has certainly been a leader in, in this space. She was sworn in as Colorado's 49th Lieutenant Governor and is the first, I believe, Chief of Staff ever, or uh, Chief Operating Officer for, for the state. And in, in some ways, Governor Hickenlooper did this because of her vast expertise in the business field. Um, and that business field has been in the area of health. Uh, she herself led Kaiser Permanente right here in, in Colorado. Uh, and I have to also give her her academic props. She actually has her doctorate in public health. So all of the issues that we're addressing here today are near and dear to her heart. And for that reason, um, and her emphasis on um, addressing these issues in healthcare, we are honoring her today, uh, given um, her history, um, with, a, with the first award uh, in recognition for her outstanding contributions to promoting healthy youth development for young people in Colorado. We're delighted that she could join us here today, and I'm honored to present this award to her. Well, this is going to be a challenge, but let's see if we can. Oh, it's good. I think it's good. Well, thank you um, certainly for this honor and the opportunity to address all of you. Uh, Dr. Chop and I are personal friends, and you may or may not know this. I was on the DU Board of Trustees, and when you move into government service, you have to resign anything that you do for uh, any kind of perceived conflict of interest. So I was very sad. Uh, to leave the DU board, and my heart uh, is here, and happy to be here with all of you. And thank you, Dean McBride, for what you do and for this recognition, and Jeff, um, for being just such a great spokesman for, um, I think, what we're all here to talk about, which is universities and, and schools of social work can talk about things, but when they actually do things and take the applied perspective. That is just an amazing uh, skill and gift that we all get from the universities. And I'm thrilled to be here with um, a lot of the people that I know work for the state in our Department of Public Health and the Environment, in our Office of Behavioral Health, and in our departments of, of Department of Education. So thank you for the work that you do every day in this field. Now, I also have a personal reason why I'm happy to be here, which is that my daughter, uh, one of three, is actually a graduate of the University of Connecticut with a degree in social work and a graduate of Columbia with an MSW. So um, we've got it in the family, and she was a practitioner for a little while and then said, wow, this is complicated. I think I'm going into HR. <laughs> <laughs> But she uses her skills every day, as you can imagine, in a business environment where she's got to deal with complex people and, and huge organizational issues. So I'm really proud of her and the work that she does. 
And uh, as you heard from Dean McBride, uh, the issue of behavioral health and substance abuse is one that for many years we just didn't like to talk about. We talked about our relative who was a little off. We didn't use sophisticated words to really identify what off might mean. And uh, remember, I, I mean, and some of us are a little older than uh, many of you, but you know, the mantra in the Reagan administration was just say no, and that's all we had to think about. And it wasn't about, well, what are the reasons why people might be attracted to substance abuse or have behavioral health problems? So we've come a long way, although not far enough, in acknowledging uh, that behavioral health issues in our society are very prevalent and that we have to address them head on. Uh, you also know that we have a number of complicated issues in Colorado with respect to legalization of marijuana and the desire to make sure that it doesn't have an impact in particular on our young people. And we certainly also have an opioid crisis here in Colorado that I hear about wherever I travel. So. Uh, I've been in actually all 64 counties since I took over uh, this job because I felt, again, you can't sit in uh, your ivory tower and just make policy. You really have to go out into communities. And uh, I will share with you that I routinely ask people, what are the three biggest challenges that you have? These were county commissioners, mayors, business people. And the three issues, uh, not surprisingly, number one was always healthcare, both its affordability, its lack of transparency, the lack of quality and accessibility. Uh, and the second was affordable housing. The third was our infrastructure, but depending on where you were, and I was just in Sawatch, and I will identify Sawatch County as one of those places, uh, they actually said to me their third biggest issue was the opioid crisis. And the fact that not only is it a public health issue, but it's also an economic development issue because they couldn't, where they had jobs in rural Colorado, they couldn't find young people who could actually come to work, who could test, would not test positive for drugs and could actually be depended upon to come to work. So our own success as a state is hinged on our ability to both recognize the problems that we have and treat them. So for those of you who are in this field, uh, thank you for your work. Uh, I also travel with the governor a lot. We do town halls, and uh, if we're in Lamar or La Junta or we're on the Western Slope, we also are often asked about the lack of access to behavioral health services, particularly in rural areas where traveling uh, becomes a challenge. Uh, one thing I did at Kaiser, and then I'll talk about your communities of care, is access isn't just a problem in a rural area. Access can be a problem in, a, in, a, in the metropolitan area, not just the lack of supply of clinicians. But if you're in a healthcare setting with a primary care doctor, and he or she says, I really think you should see, maybe a psychologist or a social worker, um, but there's no one here, and you need to make another appointment, and you need to go to another building, it's just not gonna happen. So one of the things that I did when I uh, was uh, running Kaiser in five states, including Colorado, was I said, let's make sure that we have embedded in our medical office buildings where you go for routine primary care, even specialty care, a behavioral health specialist who doesn't have, who isn't booked all day long for their appointments that actually have half hour appointments with a space. So that if I'm talking to somebody who, I, the doctor, I'm talking to somebody who has found out they have a diagnosis of cancer or who I notice might have some other problems, I can simply say in half an hour, Donna's free, go see her. Not in, in uh, travel, not wait for another appointment, but to have somebody right there who can help you. So um, I think we were very proud of that model and, and uh, I know they're working on measuring some of the impact that that had. But let's talk about the work that you do and what you recognize as the importance in supporting young people. Uh, in our state, and uh, that is why I think we're especially proud to have supported the rollout of the 48 communities that care prevention site systems. Uh, we're talking about all the kinds of behaviors that we see amongst our young people, and many of them are risky, many of them are unhealthy, 
And it's important that we use every resource that we have to be able to identify them and help teachers, principals, and other school professionals be able to identify them and figure out, well, what do I do? I'm a teacher, I'm not trained to manage this problem, but at least if I can identify it and know what the re community resources are, I can help young people. Uh, one of my jobs, as you heard described, I'm the chief operating officer for the state, which has never existed before. And from that perspective, we want uh, the state to be accountable to the citizens that it serves and to measure what impact are we having. So we spend a lot of time bringing together people from different departments, different sectors, and saying, where do we need to go? Um, what do we need to do about the fact that we are the, f the state with the fifth highest suicide rate? What do we need to do about the fact that we have uh, equity issues in terms of who graduates from high school and who graduates from uh, college and how can we help improve those rates? So we're very transparent about that and what I love about this model is that it also is about identifying what are the challenges, where do we want to go, and measuring results. So um, we know that eighth graders are a very vulnerable go uh, group. Um, I always laugh when people say, oh, high school's really terrible, and as a parent of three kids, I'd say, no, no, middle school, that's where it is. And that's where you really can have an impact, because they won't get to high school, and they won't be able to do the kind of work that we want them to do and graduate if middle school uh, issues aren't addressed. And where, I, quite frankly, I think I'm gonna be an armchair psychologist. I took Psych 101. Uh, <laughs> but where their brains aren't developed to have the social skills to understand that bullying is unhealthy, that they're growing, they're changing. And in high school, you get a little more stable. So the intervention work at eighth grade, we know, is just critical. Um, and the impact that you've been able to have uh, is tremendous in reducing delinquent behavior, in reducing the use of alcohol, and actually reducing even cigarette use. So I really want to just thank you for the work that you do, and we're so fortunate to have, I think, a community in Colorado of uh, colleges and universities that are working with us in the state who are accountable to deliver results, and I really want to thank you for your commitment to the young people here today. I always, people always, I always laugh when people say, well, how, what's it like getting older? And I said, it's great, because I would never want to be young again. <laughs> it's too complicated. So on behalf of the entire state of Colorado, and I know you're going to hear from the governor, uh, just thank you for your work. Continue it and ask questions, but know that your work is tremendously appreciated across our entire state. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor. That was, that was set, set a perfect context, I think, for the work that we're going to uh, be talking about today. So thanks so much for coming and sharing those comments. Um, we also have, uh, as kind of a, a, a special uh, feature today, we, uh, some comments from the governor. The, so we, we, we invited the governor. His schedule didn't allow him to come, as you might guess. Um, and he was, Governor Hickenlooper was, received a public service award from the Society for Prevention Research, which many of you in this room are familiar with, um, in May. He was, he was not in Washington, D.C. to receive the award, so I went, I had a meeting with the governor last week and presented the award uh, to him, and he was gracious enough to uh, provide us with a short video, video clip um, reflecting on some of the work that we're doing today. So we're going to show that in, in just a second. Um, this was the Public Service Award is recognized by SBR. This is an international group of prevention scientists and, and uh, policy makers and advocates and others interested in, pr in promoting prevention. Uh, Rico Conlano was the uh, president uh, in May and, and presented this award um, to Governor Hickenlooper in absentia. So I was happy to uh, pick, pick that up and uh, meet with the governor last week briefly and give him the award. So I'm going to put this on. It's going to take a minute to get this laptop 
up here this, so bear with me. Abby, you might want to come up. Let's see. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Here we go. Okay. So here's a few words from the governor. Good morning. I want to thank the Society for Prevention Research for the 2017 Public Service Award. The Society is among the nation's leading organizations in promoting tested and effective prevention programs and policies for young people with, with behavioral health problems. I'd also like to thank the many dedicated state personnel and, and community representatives who made this award possible. Colorado and the nation are at a defining moment in preventing behavioral health problems in young people. The use of opioids and other drugs are on the rise, and the youngest among us are among the most vulnerable. In the past few years, the state has initiated and supported the rollout of 48 Communities of Care, or CTC, prevention sites. We're delighted this event will help amplify our efforts to address the issue where it's happening. We also look forward to learning from a report co-led by Professors Jeff Jensen and David Hawkins on unleashing the power of prevention. This report is helping increase prevention programs and policies in Colorado and in other states around the country. I'd like to thank Dean Amanda Moore McBride and Professor Jensen of the Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Denver for organizing and hosting this important event. This is a shining example of DU's commitment to research, teaching, and service for the public good. And to the Graduate School of Social Work for their dedication to transforming behavioral health and prevention. I hope it's a successful and productive day. Thank you for your commitment to helping ensure the healthy development of young people in Colorado. Okay, thank you, Governor. <laughs> Some inspiring words. Uh...